Church. Um, the scripture reading is um, Christian Standard Bible, Matthew 5, and I'm going to read verse 21 to 26. Um, the heading says, Murder begins in the heart. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to our fire. So, if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of, here, out of there until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of God. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Desefo and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ uh, through Fellowship City as elder and pastor of this church. This morning I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. We're in a new series, we're in a series that we've been in a series for a couple of weeks, four weeks now, and this series is titled Deeper. Through this series we present an invitation, an invitation to know deeper, an invitation to understand deeper, an invitation to experience deeper, an invitation to listen deeper, an invitation to experience deeper, an invitation to, to be transformed deeper, an invitation to see deeper, an invitation to feel deeper, an invitation to read deeper, an invitation to love deeper, an invitation to give deeper, an invitation to share deeper, an invitation to walk with Jesus. That's the invitation that we had, that we shared as part of this deeper series. So why? Why an invitation to go deeper? Because we're a disciple-making church and we are trusting God to awaken our hearts and minds to accept the invitation that Jesus gives. We believe that going deeper enables a greater grasp and context to our realities and it adds the color to the black and white. It enables us to better handle our context if we are going deeper with Jesus. This morning we will see an invitation from Jesus, an invitation for a reformed heart, an invitation for pursuing reconciliation, an invitation to pursue godliness and to remove all impurities from our heart. We will this morning see that the heart is deceitful, but that the heart is important and we need to guard our heart. The heart needs to be transformed. That's what we'll see this morning. Peter mentioned a couple of weeks ago that uh, if you don't start the sermon without a picture, then it's not going well. I was not aware of this, but, I, but I'll follow suit. So behind you will see a picture, which is a picture of a series on Netflix. The series is titled Beef. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case, a word is worth the essence of the series. So the whole series shows how sin, like anger, like insult can grow like wildfire in the heart. The series starts with both main characters driving out of a mall parking lot. However, they have a near bumper bashing experience because obviously they were driving slow out of the, the mall parking lot. This near bumper bashing experience escalates as one of the drivers speeds away from the incident. The other races after the first driver and the chase ensues. They drive over gardens, they drive over robots, and the chase stops because the first car gets away. But instead of the first car continuing to get away, it stops and reverses at a high speed. And that's the picture you see right there. And you can see the one who's face chasing is now calling the vehicle to stop um, because it's about to bump into you. Uh, so the vehicle does stop and then speeds away again. So what we see throughout the series is, is a desire for revenge. So they take the number plates of each other 
and this just this beef just continues to develop and grow. The series escalates because they fan their desire for revenge. They fan their desire for hatred for one another. They lie, they cheat, they break things, they involve others, they lose their families, one loses a house or a job, their hatred consumes them and it causes them to grow, causes them to continually um, grow with revenge and hatred in, in their heart. So the heart is deceitful. The heart can fuel and nurture the hatred to even the point of death. This morning we will see this in Matthew 5. We will see a warning of what we should stay away from. We will see a call for reconciliation and we will come to grapple with what guarding our hearts should look like. So that we are enabled to go deeper and closer to God. So four points this morning. We'll do an overview of Matthew. Uh, look at murder in the heart. Look at pursue reconciliation and guarding your heart. Let me pray for us as we get into God's word. Lord, we pray that this morning that you would um, quiet our hearts. That by your spirit that you would speak to our hearts. That all the things that are happening in and around us um, would be quiet. There will be no distractions as we hear from you, as we hear from the spirit tugging at our heart. We pray that you would Tell us those things that you want us to know, to say, and to do. We pray that there would be reformation of our heart. That you would continue to conform us more and more to the likeness of Christ. That you would cleanse our hearts and give us a steadfast spirit in you. So be with us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. It's always important to understand the context of a particular passage as you try to understand the words that are used in that passage. So the, back, the book of Matthew is written by Matthew. The text collector is also one of the disciples of Jesus. He spends a lot of time with the disciples and he collected many of the stories and collates this book of Matthew. So Matthew himself features in the book, chapter 9. The whole book is stories that he carefully has put together to show Jesus Christ as a continuation and fulfillment the story about God and Israel. And Matthew does that by showing that Jesus is the Messiah from the line of David. And that Jesus is authoritative to teach. And he is a new Moses. Or the greater Moses. And that Jesus is God with us. So chapters 1 to 3 start off with genealogy. You see the image behind me. This is the same with many books. Why a genealogy book? The genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, shows how Jesus is linked to the Old Testament. It shows that characters of the Old Testament, like Abraham and David, who are prophesied to bear offspring that will produce the Messiah or the Savior, is true. So it links Jesus to the timelines and stories of the Old Testament. So being a descendant of Abraham also means Jesus is going to bring God's blessing to the nations. Genesis 12, we see Abraham will be blessed and his descendants we were made into a great nation, and this comes to what is credited to Abraham as righteousness and fulfilled by the blood of Jesus, that we can see and experience the blessing of God by the forgiveness of sins. So Moses is credited as the most important Jewish prophet, writing five books of the Torah and leading the Israelites across the Red Sea and out of captivity. He is born at a time where every male baby was killed, but he is spared through actions of hiding him. There are parallels of Moses the most important Jewish prophet in Jesus. Moses crossed the Red Sea and Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan. Moses is in the wilderness for 30 years and Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. Moses receives the law for the Israelites following Jesus, gives the law, and we see that particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what we'll see this morning. Matthew also shows in his writing that Jesus is greater than Moses because Jesus delivers Israel from slavery gives new teaching which is, which is different to Moses. And Jesus delivers ultimate and complete saving from sin through his death on the cross, through the year of the Lord. We spoke about this last week. So Jesus starts a new covenant with his people through his death on the cross. Chapters 4 to 7 includes two chapters of what is most famously known as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, the first sermon that Jesus gives, the greatest the G, these chapters show God's rescue operation for the world. We see Jesus confront evil, 
Jesus restores God's reign and Jesus creates a new family. This new family joins Jesus when he's at the top of the mountain to hear from Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount teaches how to live in the kingdom of God. Remember Moses receives the law from the mountain and Jesus gives the law on the mountain. So what Jesus speaks about from chapters 5 to 6 to 7 is how to live in the kingdom of God. And it is upside down thinking from what everyone is used to. The way of heaven is different from the way of the world. Some of the things Jesus taught is that adultery begins in the heart. Everyone would be thinking that it begins physically. But no, it starts in the heart. And that's what Jesus was teaching. Don't store treasures here on heaven that is different because as Peter preached two weeks ago, people would dig up and store treasures for themselves here. But Jesus is saying, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So rather focus on storing up treasure in heaven. It's another one of Jesus' teachings. Judge not so that you are not judged. That's Matthew 7 verse 1. Still part of that, that, that sermon that Jesus gives. Love your enemies. It's another part of what Jesus is saying. Which is different to what they would have assumed Jesus would say. These are just some of the upside down things and themes that you get from the Sermon on the Mount. How to live in the kingdom of God is having a transformed heart. We will come back to this point. So we still have our second point, murder in the heart. Verse 21 starts with, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. As I mentioned before, during the overview, the book of Matthew includes a number of Old Testament scripture, which then is used specifically to link Jesus to the Old Testament prophets and scripture. So you have heard that it was said to our ancestors. This is Jesus referring to the past which features, Mo- which features Moses, who re- receives the law from the mountain. He comes down the mountain and tells the Israelites about the law. This is Exodus 20. Do not murder is one of those. And if you break any of the law, you'll be subject to judgment. Let's look at verse 22. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. Other versions say, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. So raka is an Aramaic term of abuse or insult. It's a derogatory term meaning empty-headed. So it's important to note that verses 22 includes three warnings. The first warning is seen in part A of verse 22. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. That's, that's part A. So anger with your brother or sister will bring about judgment. So not only physical murder, but the emotional the feeling of someone having wronged you. This anger, which is the root of murder, now also will bring God's judgment. <coughs> Second warning is insults. So name calling, Raka is one of those insults, as I just explained. So anyone who insults his brother or sister will also have to answer for their insults. The third warning is whoever calls someone a fool will be subject to hell fine. So fool in this context is saying that someone is beyond the reach of God. It's condemning someone. Fool is often described as someone with a hardened heart. So who is not part of God's people. So calling someone fool would be to condemn them. So Jesus here is going further than, than, than the law as they know it. He's saying it is not only physical murder that will bring about judgment, but also murder in the heart. Being angry, insulting and condemning someone with your words counts as murder also. This is in line with the two greatest commandments that Jesus says for fulfills all the other laws. And we see this in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. Jesus is questioned what is the greatest commandment by one of the experts of the law, one of the Pharisees. This is by way of them testing Jesus. But Jesus answers them. He said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. That is the context of why there is judgment here. If we are angry at our brothers or sisters, if we slander or hurl insults at them, if we condemn them, then we are not observing the law. We are not loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and mind, and we are not loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. So Jesus is saying we should not have anger towards our brothers and sisters. We should not insult or we should not condemn them. I consider myself a good driver, even though I actually don't believe I like driving. 
I am a safe driver. Uh, many of my friends would, would trust me to be behind the wheel. I've driven around South Africa twice at least, and to other select countries a couple of times. I, I, I however, do not think my wife would agree. Um, uh, actually, she would, she would agree that I'm a good driver. She would agree that, but she would, she would want to add more to me being a good driver. She sometimes says, if only others could see what I'm seeing now, <laughs> and laugh and smile. Now, this is me being vulnerable. She says, if anyone could see what I'm seeing now, and laugh and smile. This is when road rage, road rage rears its ugly head, and she can see my face change, maybe some heightened breathing, um, when I might harbor some ill feelings to someone because they've cut me off, um, or jumped right in front of me, or did not indicate, um, not that I always indicate. Um, so this anger can boil the blood, it can sit in the heart, and this anger can consume. I have learned to bring this anger to God so that it doesn't consume my heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful beyond measure. Cain and Abel are the first two sons of Adam and Eve, Genesis 4. Both bring sacrifices to God, but God had accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's. So this jealousy, this causes jealousy. However, Cain is counseled by God. God asks, why are you angry? And why not just do the right thing, meaning give God the best offering? And God says, if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It's desires for you, but you must rule over it. But this jealousy grows until ultimately Cain kills Abel. Another story, David is king. David sends out his army to battle and he stays behind. He then sees a woman, Bathsheba, bathing and sends people to find out who she is. David knows she's married but sends for her anyway. Sleeps with her and later she reports that she's pregnant. David sends word to call back Uriah from war so that he can sleep with Bathsheba to cover up his sin. Uriah refuses while they, they are at work, while they war. And filled with anger, David then plans and gets Uriah killed when he's back at war. Both of these examples should show you that the heart is deceitful, the heart is bad, that small things like anger, like jealousy, like insults, like condemning someone can lead to murder as a sin in our heart escalates and it entrenches the heart and it consumes the heart. I know this is hard for but we need to constantly reform the heart. We need to do so every day because we'll be faced with the root of evil in our hearts if we don't reform our heart constantly. So murder begins in the heart. Our third point, pursue reconciliation. Our second, let's look at pursuing reconciliation. Verse 23. So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. The word so in this context is a coordinating conjunction. We not only teach the Bible, every now and then we include some English as well. So, so this coordinating conjunction basically links two ideas or sentences. It is, it is similar or the same as therefore. So we have to understand what happened before and link it to what is about to happen now. So we have come to understand verses 21 to 22 to mean hatred towards your brother or sister jeopardizes your soul. Hatred towards your brother or sister jeopardizes your soul. The hatred is in being angry, using words of insults like Rakao, calling them fool, all of which will jeopardize your soul. It's important to note, uh, just a side it's important to note that the word used for judgment in verses 21 and 22 is the same, but in Israel there were local courts that would be used to judge someone who had committed murder. This was a normal process. However, the judgment for someone who had anger in their hearts is judgment for God to dispense, as there's no judgment then. For anger in the heart, for they could not see anger in the heart, but God knows the heart and He will touch our hearts. We can't hide our hearts from Him. So there's two ideas that we see in verses 21 to 26. The first, the first idea we see in verses 21 to 22, we see our own contempt, our own hatred 
to our brothers and sisters. And then verses 23 to 26, we see Jesus moves to, to relationships with other people. What is Jesus saying here in verses 23 to 26? I think it's important to understand and to remember what comes a few verses before as we try to understand what he says here. Verse 9 of chapter 5 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of God is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I think this is important to understand what Jesus is saying here. We should be peacemakers as Christians. We should be reconciled to those that have something against us, as far as it depends on us. Romans 12 verse 18. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. This means we can't force people to be reconciled to us. Jesus was in conflict or had people who were angry with him for no good reason. Some because of the true claims about his identity. So we are only responsible for what others hold against us if there has been sin or mistakes from us. We should pursue reconciliation as far as it depends on us. And we can't force a reconciliation. So we ought to pursue reconciliation with those we have wronged and we ought to be careful about anger, about name calling and about condemning people. We ought to reform our hearts because that is where, that is what we see from the text. From the heart comes, or from the heart we interpretize our soul. So how then do we reform our hearts? Before we try to reform our hearts, we need to ask, what is the heart? What does the Bible say about the heart? The heart is the core of who we are, the core of our being. The heart is the heart is the core of who we are, the core of our being, where our emotions and our desires live. When I say emotions, I mean emotions driven by our truest motives. Our truest motives drive the nature of our emotion, and this, this is in turn a part of our desire. The Bible says we should guard our hearts, and we see this in Proverbs 4. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Why? Because our heart is deceitful. We see this in Mark 7, verse 21 to 23. For from within, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, theft, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and define a person. <clears throat> Sometimes the deceit in our heart is also from the lies we tell ourselves. Lies that I'm in control and I can keep at the edge of sin. But we should learn from Cain that it's dangerous to play with sin and nurture the evil in my heart. Another lies, I have to shut down or close my heart to protect it. God wants to reform the heart. Psalm 147 says, He heals the broken heart and binds their wounds. So that's another lie to want to shut down or close our hearts because God wants to reform our hearts. Another lie is, I have to live with the hurt and brokenness in my heart. God wants to heal the broken heart and bind their wounds. We need to guard our hearts, church. For if we don't, we jeopardize our soul. So how do we guard our hearts now that we understand what our heart is? We can use Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 23 to guard our hearts. Verse 20 says, My son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. The words... My words, you see, are God's word. Here God is saying we ought to pay attention to his words and listen closely to his sayings. <clears throat> attention means to give concentration to something that caught your eye or interest. So focus, concentrate on my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Closely is, is how we ought to listen. Verse 21 says, don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart. Don't lose sight of my words and sayings. So concentrate on them. Don't forget them. Don't be distracted. Keep the words in your heart. We have to use the word of God to saturate our hearts. This means letting the word of God seep in and stay in our hearts. The psalmist tells us 
What happens if we keep the word of God in our heart? Every Christian needs to be actively working to place God's word in his heart. So, so think of a garden. So if a garden is, is unkept, it goes, it goes and goes by without attention. If we lose sight of where the garden is, if we don't work the garden, then it will go to ruins. The garden will develop weeds, like bad habits. These habits will grow, just like murder in the heart can grow. So we have to actively work on the garden. We have to first understand what kind of garden this is. So we have to have some knowledge about the garden. And the best place to go is the owner of the garden. It's to go to God, the creator of everything. To understand what kind of garden this is and how we're to keep the garden. So we go to the word of God to understand how to do that. So we read the Bible. We learn about the garden. We learn about God. We meditate on the word of God. And that's also how we can learn how to, to keep this garden. How to put up the right practices to keep the garden. So meditation will also help us to learn what is good to have in the garden and what to remove from the garden. Because it's a, it's a continuous process. Think of repentance and fighting against sin. Meditation will help with deepening repentance because the word of God is in your heart and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about the things in your heart that don't belong. Deceit doesn't belong there. Shame does not belong there. Lying does not belong there. Pride and greed don't belong there. We should then practice repentance. Turn away from the sin in our lives. Turn away from the shame because we should not have shame. We can, we can fully go to God and bring everything to Him. So think about removing the weeds in the garden. The weeds choke life from going. Think about uprooting the weeds from, from as deep as you can. So repent and up, uproot those, those weeds. So meditating on the, God, on the word of God enables us to grow in knowledge and appreciation of who God is. Think about the garden, working on it, knowing and seeing it in its beauty makes you appreciate it more, makes you fall in love with it. So we need to meditate on the word of God, church. That is how we guard our heart, by letting the word of God sit in our heart. Letting the word of God cultivate our heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit conforms us to the likeness of Christ. As the Holy Spirit shows us those things that should not be there, so we can uproot them and speak the gospel to them. We also need to pray. This is how we speak to God. We need to ask God to create in us a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit in us. This is what Psalm 51 says. We need to bring our heart to God and surrender our life to Him. We ought to desire, we ought to desire to know Him more. This is how we guard our hearts, by knowing God more. That should be our desire. We may be sitting here this morning or listening on YouTube or your podcast with a heavy heart. Maybe a heart that has got some murder at its core, or a heart that's got a desire to harm a brother or sister, or a heart that is full of lust, a heart that is full of desires that are not good, or a heart that converts what is your neighbor's, a heart that, that's got greed in it, a heart that wants to make more money, maybe not authentically, or a heart that is slanderous, meaning you speak ill of others. And you may have the Holy Spirit speaking and showing you these things, these themes that you need to uproot. These things that are weighing your heart down, that are weighing your walk with Jesus down. These things that are choking the life out of your heart. Don't cultivate sin or anger in your heart. If this is you, if you're sitting here and that is, that is what you experience, I want us to pray now. I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes and just pray quietly in your heart. I'm going to say a prayer and you can follow me as, as, as I pray. Let's use this as a prophetic action to break the hold of things that have taken root in our hearts. Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. I bring my heart that is in desperate need of restoration. I pray, Lord, that you give me a clean heart and that you renew a steadfast spirit in me. 
I pray that you can remove all evil that has consumed my heart and replace it with a passion for your name. Would you give me a desire to read your word, to meditate on your word, with the Holy Spirit be an audible voice that points me to the cross of Christ and confirm, confirms me to be more and more like Christ. Thank you that as we pray, you hear us and if you break strongholds and start to soften the soil of our hearts. Continue to bow church as I as I close this in prayer. Lord, you know our hearts. If we pray that prayer softly and quietly in our hearts, we know the state of our hearts. But you want to have this prophetic action of, of crying out to you for a restored heart. That you continue the good work that you began in us. That started with the death of Christ on the cross for our sins. Would you use the Holy Spirit as a compass, as a guide, as a counselor to help us to uproot all that does not belong in our heart. We see from your word that murder belongs in the heart. If we cultivate the sin, the deceit, and the lies of the enemy, and the lies we tell ourselves, Help us through the power of the Holy Spirit to not cultivate the lies, to not cultivate the work of the enemy. Help us to pursue reconciliation where we are at fault. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to remember the first and greatest command, to love the Lord our God with all our soul, with all our heart, with all our mind, and to love our name as we love ourselves. Only with a reformed heart, only as we become more and more conformed to the likeness of Christ, can we also continue to go deeper and deeper in you. Help us to accept this invitation. Cleanse our hearts from all evil. Grant us a new heart and renew a steadfast spirit in us. And we pray all this in Jesus.